This video was sponsored by Ren. Coffee is without a doubt the most beloved drink here in the UK. Well, actually, I think you'll find there is a more <laughs> superior. Coffee is the second most used commodity in the entire world, second only to oil. And we all love that. But coffee's history, production, and chemistry are far more complex than most people think. Generally, I take a bit of a grim view on the coffee you can get from the big chain coffee houses. I probably shouldn't name any in particular, but some of my least favorite are and Al's Toy Barn. So what follows now is a short documentary I've made on how larger coffee chains generally produce their coffee. Here, come, 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 we found some. Oh, I can't believe we, we found some so easily. Oh, yeah. Mm, get that in there. This is how we stop that flavor. Mm, mm. Ten more, please. Big coffee brands generally source their beans. Beans. Like cereal grains, in that they buy as much as they can at the lowest price possible, and then blend it all together. They then patented it, packaged it, and they slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and you're, you're selling it. You want to sell it. I just realized I dressed up as Jeff Goldblum in my last video too. I swear, this is completely unintentional. Legend tells of a 9th century Ethiopian sheep herder named Kaldi, who herded his sheep through the forests of Kaffa. He noticed one day after his sheep ate some strange berries, they were imbued with a godlike energy. Inquisitive, he too ate the berries and had the natural response. Oh, I hate those berries! Although this story is likely to be... <clears throat> Also tribe. Ethiopia is generally believed to be where coffee originated. And by the 16th century, it already spread up through Africa and the Ottoman Empire. Eventually, coffee made its way up to Europe. But as it originated from predominantly Muslim areas, the Europeans who were Christian didn't initially trust it. So, you know, no fucking change there. With Europe came the British East India Company. Oh, good. Realizing that they could make even more money off the suffering of their fellow human beings, they used their advantages to trade coffee further afield, like America and Indonesia. In the beginning, America wasn't too thrilled about the arrival of coffee because it was still too expensive to realistically come in grande size. So it went mostly unnoticed until 1770 when America held the Boston Tea Party. The event was a total failure with not enough clotted cream being served or something. And so America boycotted tea and started drinking coffee instead. Just to be clear, the Boston Tea Party was actually an American political protest, where American patriots, some of which were disguised as Native Americans, dumped tea into Boston Harbor, which caused it to become banned in America. And, you know, less significantly, started the American Revolution. Pay the tax! Long live King George! You'll be back! Following all of this, coffee eventually made its way into Mid and South America. And humans quickly realized the perfect climate to grow coffee was in fact the rainforest. Oh, brilliant. Okay, I'm starting to see where this is going. Maybe we should have just stuck to drinking tea. Now see, this is what I've been <laughs> saying. You see, originally coffee was actually just grown in the shade of existing forests. And this was until the 1970s when some arsat realized, hmm, if you grow coffee in open fields, you actually get a higher yield of coffee. Oh well, fucking say no more. Ah yes, but that can reduce biodiversity in those areas by up to 80%. Sorry, I can't hear you, I'm clearing trees. While coffee was spreading through the Americas, the Dutch, we're helping it to spread through Asia. And eventually the whole world was drinking it. It's just that good. Oh yeah. Coffee is grown on coffee trees. Are you getting this down? Where's my note boy? There is actually a coffee tree growing in Kew Gardens, but I can't fucking find it. Coffee trees grow bre breast. <laughs> coffee trees grow best in warm, humid environments, and they can grow in either the shade or the sun. When coffee is grown in the sun, large areas of forest usually need to be cleared for these new trees to grow. This means that a variety of animals will lose their habitats, and the now bare earth will eventually be scorched by the sun, ruining the soil. It's the perfect method, boys. The sun is obviously quite the source of energy, so when you grow coffee in the sun, you get a much higher yield of beans. But because these plants grow so quickly, the soil isn't able to pass on its flavor to the beans, and they're a lot blander. 
Due to this high yield and low flavour, sun-grown coffee can be sold a lot more cheaply. So shade-grown coffee, conversely, does produce a lower yield, but it's far richer in flavour, and it doesn't... <clears throat> completely decimate all it comes into contact with. I'll take a hundred bags of sun-grown, please. Do you trade in kitten blood? Coffee trees actually produce cherries rather than beans, and it's the seeds of these cherries that we call coffee beans. It's a little bit strange, but what can you do? The basic process of going from cherries to seeds is incredibly complex, but it's mainly about removing the layer around these seeds. Methods can vary, but the gist of it is... Ripe cherries are usually hand-picked from trees. If water is scarce, the beans are processed using the dry method. This involves spreading them out and drying them in the sun. They are then manually moved around to prevent them from spoiling. Once dry enough, they're hand-moved again to be milled. This removes the cherry's outer husk, known as the exocarp, mesocarp, endocarp, magicarp, and gyridose. They are then ready to be exported as green coffee. They're called this as the beans are not yet dark in color. The beans, the, well, the beans are green. The wet method is more common and generally produces higher quality coffee beans. The wet method requires water. Someone better be getting this down. It involves first pouring the cherries into a pulpa, which removes their skin and pulp. These beans are then fermented in water to remove their mucilage layer. As usual, they are agitated and processed by hand as they ferment. The beans are then sun-dried as before. Quite a few other steps are usually needed, but this is generally what happens in the exporting countries. It takes dozens of people months of constant work just to make a sack of beans like this. If you go into the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. The beans are then ready to be exported to other destinations for sale. Hi, and welcome to Making Coffee with Up Is Not Jump. Water. Beans. Compress. The next line. I can smell the orange juice. Oh, why did I do this? Oh, and it's in the pause. There's a whole world of ways to make coffee. From the siphon method, which looks like you're trying to use lab equipment to grow a fucking xenomorph, to cold brews, where you just soak the ground coffee beans in cold water until coffee is made. This table smells. Kitchen equipment is soaked in beans as well. First, procure some beans. Generally, it's best to grind your own beans, because once they're ground, they lose their flavour very, very quickly. For the amount of beans and water you need to use, just follow the packaging instructions. You can get gorgeous with the amounts, but I'm gorgeous enough. For this pour-over method, you want between a medium and fine grind. What does that mean? Uh, see, mine, mine says it. For the consistency of the ground beans, you should be looking for that of table salt. So we put in our beans, and we give our beans a good grind. <laughs> it smells like burning plastic. Picking that up was a bad idea. <laughs> I have procured, much to my wife's fury and strife, this Chemex coffee maker. I hate you. Uh, excuse me, I use every one of these daily. So now that we have some beans, we'll open the Chemex. Chemex. <laughs> so this is a Chemex coffee device. I hear it's really good. I saw it on Binging with Babish and we've stolen the segment. How old is one? Does I, fo I fold it in half twice? What the fuck is that? So we insert our cone. Ladies, please, I'm married. And run some water through it. You can get kettles with a nice spout to help control the water. This is a houseplant watering can. We definitely shouldn't be drinking this coffee. <laughs> we then add our coffee. Then pour in half the water to start. Once we've added half the water, we wait for it to drip through. For the second pour, your main goal is to push all the coffee grounds back into the center. Now that we're basically done, we're going to get rid of our coffee grounds. Always compost your coffee, as food waste in landfills produces large amounts of CO2. I'm not saying it again. <laughs> mm. I shouldn't drink that, it's full of plant waste. And some. 
I can put it, no, let me put it in a cup. Wait, did I, no, wait, did I spit? I think I spit back into it, you probably shouldn't drink. Remember, I was like, oh, 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 you shouldn't drink this. Now, as we all know, drugs are bad. Unless your government can use them to further a political or commercial agenda, then they're okay. Now, I'm told that caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine are generally fine. Taking marijuana is akin to repeatedly stabbing your mother in the eyes with a paring knife. And opioids are absolutely fine as long as they have the backing of an unscrupulous pharmaceutical chain. I'm getting political again, Benjamin. Now, the way drugs work is they generally mimic compounds that already naturally interact with the body. This is why many drugs on the market are actually derived from natural sources like plants. The chemical morphine, for example, derived from the opium poppy, is shaped like some naturally occurring endorphins that we already find in our body. The areas that are similar between these chemicals are highlighted in bold. Because these two chemicals have parts that are so similar, they can interact with the body in similar ways. In this case, both of these chemicals can reduce symptoms of pain. Coffee. Contains many, many chemicals, but the one we all know and love that gives me cluster headaches is caffeine. Caffeine, just like morphine, mimics a naturally occurring chemical we already find in our body. And this chemical is adenosine. Now I need to learn how to pronounce this. Adenosine relates to the Krebs cycle. This fucking thing. When I was 17, I had to learn this cycle. All of it. Why? I don't fucking know. Some 80 year old guy in a government building decided all science taught everywhere needed to be inherently shite. I hear there are a shortage of young people wanting to be scientists. I wonder why. Anyway, ad ad adenosine. It's a slight oversimplification, but the adenosine in our body generally acts to make us a little bit sleepy. Its shape and what it's made of means it can slot itself into the adenosine receptors in our body. Caffeine has a similar shape and structure to adenosine, so that means it too can fit into these sleepy receptors. But when caffeine goes into these receptors, it doesn't activate them. It doesn't make us tired. It just kind of blocks them up. The result of this is that adenosine that does make us tired can't get into these receptors anymore. So we're not going to be made tired we're actually gonna be more alert. Now this kind of science is actually pretty boring, so well done at home for not killing yourself yet. The real sciencey term for all of this is that we say that caffeine is a antagonist to adenosine. Caffeine binds with adenosine receptors blocking them. Adenosine can't get in, so we can't be made tired, and so we're fucking awake. I've taken my shoes off, eh? Hope you don't mind. The main point of this video was to show you that the actual production of coffee is a hugely manual process. More often than not, beans are planted, grown, picked, transported, inspected, washed, fermented, and dried by hand. And even feet. We see coffee as this extremely cheap commodity, but the process of making it is actually incredibly difficult. Literally millions of workers and farmers rely on us to respect this luxury product because that's what it is. Now this ain't like my global warming video where I asked you to go out and fucking vote. If you care about this stuff, there's varying degrees of things that you could do. The first is beans. Beans. Avoid robusta beans as these are usually grown in the sun. This means that they're lower in quality and are usually linked with deforestation, which we don't want. Google your favorite coffee chain or provider and see what kind of beans they use. If they use robusta, you can just switch. The second is the farmer's name. Another huge issue is farmers are not being paid fairly for the months of work they put into producing coffee beans. Now this may seem strange when there are all these certifications on every bag of coffee you buy, but I interviewed a pretty substantial expert on these things and I'll just say that these certifications are not as significant as you'd think. A much better indicator of quality coffee is to find a bag that actually lists a specific farmer's name. This is the best sign that the growers are in one place or one farm and are being considered as human beings. You can even Google the farmer's name you find and learn about them. You could probably even contact them, but please only do it if you have a relevant question. And if you buy your coffee online, you can also see a picture of the bag, so you can check to see if the farmer's name's there. And if you're buying fresh coffee, all you really need to do is ask your barista, where do the beans come from? You see, the only way a coffee shop's gonna know if its farmers are being treated fairly is to have a relationship with the specific people or person that it's importing the beans for them. Then if they tell you they don't know or they don't have that information at hand, then ethical coffee probably isn't that important to that specific coffee shop. And then if that's the case, you can just find a different coffee shop that supplies ethical beans. And finally, there's something that you and I can do together. But I'll tell you when I get home, because I don't know what it is yet. 
So as well as all the things I mentioned in this video, a very big and very simple thing you can do to improve the impact of your gorgeous life on this world is to reduce your carbon footprint to zero. Now short of holding my breath for the rest of my life, this seems like an impossible task. But thanks to today's sponsor, Ren, it's actually very easy. Ren is a website where you can calculate your carbon footprint, then simply offset it by funding a mix of carbon reduction projects. It takes a few minutes and then it's, it's done. One of the big projects I've learned about is biochars. This project removes flammable dead wood from California's forests to help stop wildfires. Then it turns the wood into biochar, a stable form of carbon that persists for thousands of years. This project is nothing short of fab <laughs> because it does so many different things to help reduce CO2 from getting into the environment. So by answering a few questions about your lifestyle, you can find out your carbon footprint and learn the most impactful ways to reduce it. But because you can't reduce your carbon footprint to zero without resorting to the method mentioned earlier, you can simply pay to offset what you have left after reducing. Once you sign up to make a monthly contribution to offset your carbon footprint, you can receive monthly updates from the projects you support. You get to see what your money is spent on with photos and details of every tree planted, every acre reforested, and every ton of carbon offset. It will take a lot to end the climate crisis, but you can get some peace of mind and start helping today by learning more at ren.co. Or just check the description or the pinned comment below to sign up. The first 100 people who sign up will get 10 extra trees planted in their name. And that's it. I hope you all enjoyed the video and have a nice day.